Oh my gosh, why am I so nervous? Hello, class. Mm, things look a little different around here. The millennial core mural you all know and love, she's dead. I killed her. And also I moved. Listen, moving has thrown my life into total chaos. But I think it is always important in times like this to remind myself that it could always be worse. It could be 2018. Lil Dicky could still be a prominent force in pop culture. Today, I just wanted to look back at, dare I say, an iconic moment in internet history. I mean, certainly an infamous one. I wanted to talk about TanaCon, otherwise known as the DashCon for straight people. And it didn't even have a ball pit. Long before there was TanaCon, there was VidCon. VidCon was founded in 2010 by Hank and John Green, and since its creation, it really has been the go-to convention for content creators and fans to meet. Especially back in the day when YouTube was much more centralized, this really was the best place to see all of your favorite creators in one space. I mean, the first VidCon was just a group of 1,400 people in a hotel conference room, but just by 2014, nearly 20,000 people attended the event. Last year, over 50,000 people attended VidCon. Even though plenty of competitors have popped up over the years like Playlist Live or more niche events like BeautyCon or MagCon, nothing has managed to outlast VidCon or even come close to these attendance numbers. I can tell you as a kid who was born, raised, and groomed on the internet, my teenage self was dying to go to VidCon. Every year I would see the Brick Crew, Dan and Phil, O2L post their VidCon vlogs with the exact same Kevin MacLeod or iMovie music in the background, and I ate it up every time. And whenever my Tumblr mutuals would post their photos with Joey Graceffa, Tyler Oakley, Ricky Dillon, I'd be like, oh gee girl, I'm so happy for you. Glad you had such a great time. Then I'd shut my laptop and quietly seethe about how that should be me. I should be the one taking Flower Crown and Dog Filter or Snapchats with all of my faves who would soon be canceled for horrific, horrific crimes in some cases. I will honestly continue to regret not going to VidCon as a fandom brain teen because even if I went to VidCon now as an adult, there is just no way I would be able to recapture that energy of my YouTube fangirl obsessed teenage self as the cynical adult I am today. And VidCon is also just not what it once was in its first few years. Back when this was just 10,000 or less attendees, it really did seem like it was an opportunity for creators to meet their fans, for smaller creators to pick the brains of bigger creators. And the people attending the con in the early years likely all watched the same type of content. If someone had a million subscribers, Everyone who was a fan of YouTube knew who that person was, and that person would absolutely be a featured creator at VidCon. Nowadays, it feels like it's an almost daily occurrence for me to discover a content creator with an entire community around them who I've simply never heard of. Even though VidCon still is an opportunity to see a lot of content creators you wouldn't otherwise see, the scale of the event these days requires it to be a much more controlled environment. Huge content creators can't just walk through a crowd of 20,000 people without creating a hazard or even a full-on riot. And some people like to do that just, you know, for fun. Not to mention, even by 2016, there were already so many more famous YouTubers than there ever had been, far more than any convention could realistically accommodate. Each year, VidCon would have a list of featured creators who were promoted by the event. They would host meet and greets, panels, and other VidCon activities. But even if you have hundreds of featured creators, inevitably hundreds of other popular creators who want to and often do go to VidCon would not be part of that lineup. And being a featured creator didn't just mean that your content was promoted by the event. It also meant that you had increased backstage access, security assistance, a secured hotel room, which once again helped ensure that these big creators could interact with their fans as safely as possible. But perhaps because the featured creators were also seen as representatives of this major event, sponsored by YouTube and countless other big brands, VidCon oftentimes would not feature controversial creators, even if they did have a large following, that might otherwise justify that added security. And hey, at the end of the day, VidCon is a private event. They can invite whoever they want, promote whoever they want, even if it's not me, I guess. But what happens when a YouTuber is popular enough, both amongst fans and other YouTubers, to warrant a panel spot at VidCon, but perhaps still too controversial to be fully endorsed as a featured creator? I mean, we don't have to guess. That was Tana Mojo exactly in 2016. 
But first, let's take a moment to talk about today's sponsor, Lalo. I am so excited to be working with Lalo again because they are a luxury pleasure company that helps you connect with your desires, your fantasy, your partner, or just yourself. They have a huge catalog of luxury toys so that you can find out what works for you and your body. All of their toys are made from ultra premium silicone and fully waterproof, so get as wet as you want. Exploring your body with yourself or with a partner is a great way to enhance your physical and mental health. Layla is starting Black Friday celebrations early this year. This includes for the very first time their Enigma Double Sonic. The Enigma Double Sonic offers a fully customizable experience with multiple different modes and is ergonomically designed to stimulate a broad erogenous zone for maximum pleasure. Lelos's Black Friday sale starts on October 31st, but here's the exciting part. For y'all, if you use my exclusive code, you get access to these discounts before anybody else. Stay ahead of the game and use my code AshleyLalo10 to unlock an additional 10% off before the sales even start. Click the link below, get these offers before they're gone, and unlock pleasure like you've never had before. Tana Mojo is a creator who I think needs no introduction. From making storytime videos in her bedroom with that just filthy filthy door in the background to hosting her wildly successful podcast canceled with Brooke Schofield that has, you know, I'll, I'll give them credit. It's truly lived up to its name. Tana has had a storied history on this platform. Tana's time on YouTube has always been met with controversy and criticism of some kind. At times, that criticism has been very valid, such as, hey, that time she filmed a dead body and posted it on her main channel or you know, her frequent use of racial slurs back when she was a teenager. But I think because she does have a controversial past, she has also been discredited or unfairly maligned at times where it absolutely was not warranted. Tana alleged that Cody Ko slept with her when she was underage over two years ago. And it wasn't until D'Angelo Wallace rightfully pointed out how disgusting that was that those allegations were actually taken seriously. And I can't act like I'm above that at all. I remember back when I first started making videos, I made a video about Demi Lovato. And in that video, I criticized Tana for hanging out with Demi when Demi was sober and Tana wasn't. And oh my gosh, one of my dumbest takes to ever be out on the internet. Sober people can hang out with non-sober people. It was not that serious. I'm sorry, Tana, but this story is much further back in the timeline. In 2016, Tana had absolutely blown up on the internet. Dare I say, she was the pioneer of the storytime YouTube genre. This is back when people would post storytime videos with titles like, I was almost kidnapped, not clickbait storytime. You'd click on it and it'd just be about how someone happened to be in the same aisle as them at Target a couple of times. And you know, they got kind of weird vibes. The best ones were like, I gave birth to my mom, not clickbait. I'm going to tell you about the time my parents tried to impregnate me with my brother. <laughs> And then it turned out you just got tricked into watching a 30 minute video about a dream someone had a few weeks back. But back in the day, I would fall for it every time. Easily some of my favorite story times back then came from Miss Tana herself. Classics like he banged me with a toothbrush. That he f***ed me with a toothbrush. He f***ed me with a toothbrush. I want a bleach and tone, please. I want a bleach and tone. Like, can you do a bleach and tone for me, please? Like, smiley face emoji. And of course, all of her stalker story times. I don't think I've ever mentioned this, but I was like an OG fan of Tana back in the day. Tana is exactly one day older than me. And I think especially when I was a teenager, watching her videos felt like what I imagined hanging out with the cool kids in my high school would be like. She would talk about how she drank, she smoked weed, she partied, she lived this crazy, exciting life that my delusional 17 year old self was jealous of. And of course, as an adult, Tana has been very open about how rough her home life was growing up. And part of what got her into all of these crazy scenarios was that she didn't always have adults looking out for her best interests. But as a self-absorbed kid myself, I didn't consider whether that was going on in the background and just enjoyed watching her content like a lot of people did. By 2016, one year after she first started uploading YouTube videos, she had over 2 million YouTube subscribers. She was also freshly 18, which if you're Shane Dawson, is the perfect age to pee on him. It's not creepy if it's for content, I guess. And 2016 was the first year that Tana would attend VidCon. A lot like me, Tana grew up as a huge fan of YouTube and VidCon itself. 
According to Tana, leading up to the event, her manager was working with VidCon to make Tana a featured creator that year. And because Tana thought that she would be a featured creator, she announced on Twitter that she would be going and encouraged her fans to buy tickets and meet her. But shortly before the convention, the full lineup was announced and Tana isn't on the list. Even though Tana was of course disappointed, she had already promoted the event to her fans and she did still want to have a fun time going to this event she had treasured so much growing up. So once Tana got to VidCon, she was immediately swarmed by fans who were very excited to meet her, but was quickly brisked away by security. According to Tana, at that time, the VidCon staff were very upset with her, accused her of causing a fire hazard, and told her that she needed to leave the event entirely for the day. And if a featured creator had been in that same scenario, security would have helped clear space for Tana, helped her get to a backstage area, organized a meet and greet for her to actually meet her fans, but reportedly because she wasn't a featured creator, the only thing VidCon staff could do at that time was angrily tell her to leave. So Tana left. The next day, Tana had an official VidCon panel with her network at the time, Studio 71, and once again she was mobbed by fans before, according to Tana, being angrily told to leave by the then CEO of VidCon herself. Laura Chernikoff supposedly told Tana that maybe if there was enough demand for Tana next year, and if she behaved now, maybe she could be a featured creator. Meanwhile, fans are like shattering glass doors trying to get over and see Tana. Like the demand was obviously there for people who wanted to meet Tana. The next year, 2017, was I think a rough year for Tana. I actually talked about this more in depth in my YouTuber tours video a while back, so definitely watch that if you wanna hear the full story of it. But the short version is Tana told another popular slash controversial YouTuber iDubs to kill himself because he said the N-word, despite Tana herself also having a lengthy history of saying that word herself. When iDubs showed up at Tana's event just to again say the N-word at her, the whole internet laughed at this 18-year-old girl who was such a hypocrite and a liar. Oh, she was scared because a man she didn't recognize started saying slurs at her in public? When has a random man ever gone to a public event and caused harm? Some of the criticism was about how Tana was using racial slurs she had no business saying. Criticism was definitely warranted, but that really was just a side conversation in a much dumber cancellation of her. That being said though, Tana was still an incredibly popular YouTuber. I mean, she was friends with David Dobrik and Shane Dawson, two YouTubers who would certainly never have a fall from grace. And importantly, that year, she also starred in one of YouTube's original productions, Escape the Night. Back when YouTube Premium was called YouTube Bread, for about a year, YouTube attempted to compete with the massive success of streaming platforms like Netflix and Hulu by offering their own original content created by some of their most popular creators. And let me just tell you, we got some of the most obscene creations out of YouTube Red. Do y'all remember Logan Paul's YA dystopia franchise, The Thinning? Logan Paul has a YA dystopia franchise. And I cannot let you forget that that happened. Although YouTube Red shows had varying success, easily one of its most popular shows was Escape the Night by Joey Graceffa. I actually haven't watched like a full season of Escape the Night, so I was looking on Wikipedia, and even though Joey Graceffa created this show, according to Wikipedia, he's won it twice. Try harder next time, losers. Because Tana was a part of Escape the Night, she was featured all over VidCon 2017. Fans were handed out paper masks with Tana's face on them. Tana was scheduled to host an Escape the Night escape room with fans. There was an Escape the Night panel where her and the rest of the cast would answer questions. And Tana's face was wrapped around the entire front of the Expo Center. Once again, Tana booked all of these events with the understanding from VidCon that she would be a featured creator that year. But the featured creator list again came out and Tana's name was once again nowhere to be seen, despite every other Escape the Night cast member being a featured creator themselves. But again, Tana goes to the event because she promised her fans she would go. She promoted the event and VidCon themselves scheduled her for multiple appearances, which they were not paying her for, by the way. But she gets there, and once again, she is not allowed to use the backstage wings to get to her various panels. Over my head to cover my fucking appearance. Like, who the fuck am I? I'm not fucking J-Lo. Like, why the fuck do I have to do this shit? She is constantly being swarmed by fans, and security cannot help her move safely to her scheduled appearances because she is not a featured creator. Instead, she is 
fully kicked out of the event once again by the new CEO, only to be told later that because she has been such a hazard these past two years, she has been banned from the event for life. So Tana does what I think Tana does best and posts an hour long rant detailing her entire VidCon experience. And she does not hold back. Fuck VidCon, fuck Laura Chernikoff, fuck their current CEO, fuck anyone who created VidCon. And throughout the video, Tana emphasizes that she didn't need to be a featured creator just for the recognition or the prestige that comes with that. But because only featured creators were given security protection to prevent mobs or actually allowed to meet their fans, Tana was put in a lose-lose situation where anytime she went to events that VidCon signed her up for, she was a hazard just by being there. And the immediate response to this video was overwhelmingly positive. And it wasn't just Tana's fans who were on her side. Other prominent YouTubers came forward to talk about their own negative experiences with VidCon. VidCon for a long time seemed like this untouchable force in the YouTube space, and now both fans and creators felt comfortable enough to talk about their own criticisms of the event and just how corporate it had become over the past few years. But what people were most excited about was something Tana said towards the end of her rant. I think all of the rebelled people and all of the unwanted people should host a little meet and greet in Anaheim, California on the same days as VidCon. Even though this line seemingly was just a throwaway joke by Tana, people took this seriously. What if Tana hosted her own convention the same weekend as VidCon? What would you even call a convention like that? And that is how we get TanaCon. About a week after she posted her rant video, Tana released a limited merch line of TanaCon hoodies and immediately they sold out. In her 420 mukbang, that is the most 2018 thing I've ever said, she teased that a special announcement related to a meet and greet she was planning was coming very soon. Then, less than a month before VidCon, Tana announces on Twitter that she will be hosting her very own TanaCon. The same weekend as VidCon, five minutes down the road. This was a free event with a VIP option. The free tickets, according to the website, got you main stage, concert variety show, hot seat, live music, panels, Q&A, meetup opportunities, plus, and then it just ends with a plus, that's not my typo. The VIP or featured fucking creator badge was $65, which is still very cheap compared to these standard VidCon tickets, which were usually around $100 for the base ticket. This VIP ticket got you VIP main stage, gift bags. Tana later specified in a tweet that these gift bags would be quadrupled the ticket price, by the way. Fast pass for meetups, exclusive content and personalized messages from creators via text, personal pictures, and more. Within two minutes of the tickets going live, thousands of free tickets were gone. Remember that. And people were beyond excited for this event, especially as the insane lineup came out. They got the entire vlog squad. Emma Chamberlain, Ricky Dillon, Casey Neistat, Cody Ko, and most exciting of all, Shane Dawson. It really is hard to communicate just how big Shane attending TanaCon was for people. You see, back in 2018, Shane would post vlog footage with horror music from Epidemic Sound in the background, and society called them documentaries. Hey, it was a step above him peddling 9-11 theories to his child audience. These videos got tens of millions of views, and as much as people liked Shane, the only way to see him outside of his own content at that time was paparazzi footage of him waddling the way your sim moves when they have to pee. Shane Dawson is making the run, the run for his life, the run for his life. I'll never get over that clip, it's so good. Even though Shane attended the very first VidCon to support the Green Brothers, at this point in 2018, it had been years since he had attended any sort of convention, and it would certainly be his first public appearance since he had cultivated this huge audience with his documentaries. Even people who weren't fans of Tana herself would absolutely go to a convention where they had a chance to meet Shane especially if they were already in town for VidCon, and especially because these ticket prices were incredibly cheap
sheep for a guaranteed meet and greet with their favorite creator. Of course, Tana wasn't running this event all by herself. Even though we know damn well Miss Bella Thorne would run TanaCon like the Navy if she had the chance. Tana partnered with an at the time small influencer management company called Good Times Entertainment to run the event. Good Times Entertainment used to represent all the greats. Musically influencers, MagCon boys, and even Donald Trump's most special little boy, Bryce Hall. The CEO of Good Times was Haunted Tyler Oakley doll Michael Wiest, who at the time was just 20 years old. And to Michael's credit, having literally any sort of responsibility at 20 years old is a feat. I could barely handle being the lifeguard at my neighborhood pool. You think I could manage the careers of teenagers with hundreds of thousands of followers? No. From what Tana saw, Michael seemed like an incredibly successful guy experienced in the industry. He had worked closely with Playlist Live before, the closest VidCon had to a real rival. And Michael had even put together his own meet and greet event in Chicago that year called Good Times Live, where he flew Tana out, took her to wild parties, and made sure that she had a great time. Even though yes, Michael was young, so was Tana. And let's be honest, there probably weren't a ton of companies who would agree to throw together a convention like this in eight weeks. But Good Times was all in. However, even before the event started, there were signs that this event company was perhaps not quite ready to run such a big event. Despite Tana frequently posting about TanaCon on her Twitter and YouTube, emails from the event organizers were suspiciously quiet. Multiple VIP attendees noticed that despite registering for private meet and greets with various creators, a lot of them did not receive confirmation of their meet and greets. They did, however, receive a letter from Good Times reminding everyone, fuck VidCon, and oh yeah, no refunds. I mean, why would you want one of those, you commie? But on June 22nd of 2018, TanaCon officially started. Registration was scheduled to begin between 6 and 8 a.m. And come early, lines will be long. Hey, you can't say they didn't warn them. Reportedly, registration didn't actually start until 8.45 a.m. And by that point, the line was already wrapped around the front of the Marriott Hotel. And the line would only get worse from there. People waited as long as six hours in the California sun with absolutely no cover, no water, no food. Except for the few brave souls who managed to postmate a pizza and a few water bottles to ration with the crowd around them. Not to mention, these people are standing on straight, asphalt. Even though the ambient temperature that day was around 75 degrees, the ground was somewhere around 120 degrees Fahrenheit. So unless you happen to be standing near a patch of grass, you couldn't even sit down while you baked in the sun. So why was the line taking so long? Well, Tana went on Instagram Live partway through the day and told everyone not to worry. The line was only taking so long because of course, everyone had to pass through double, triple security. But according to people who did manage to get through and into the convention, the metal detectors were shoved under the registration table at a certain point, presumably because they had fallen so far behind on getting people through, they were just rushing people in. So people were walking into this large crowd of young people with seemingly no bag check or any real security of any kind. And this was shocking to a lot of Tana Mojo fans because as I mentioned earlier, she was well known at that time for talking about her own experiences with stalking and security was always something she emphasized in her story times. Also, although there were two tiers of tickets, VIP and free, there was only one line letting everyone through. Not to mention, Tana had tweeted out that this was a free event, and if you didn't already have a ticket, you could just walk over from VidCon and get in line with everybody else. Presumably, a lot of people who didn't have tickets walked away at a certain point, but the people who had paid to be there wanted to get their money's worth. Most people who were waiting outside were teenagers. $65 may be cheap for a a convention ticket, but that is not an insignificant amount of money to a kid. And these tickets might have been birthday gifts, graduation gifts, and ultimately, these people wanted to meet the creators who they idolized. As people are standing in line together, the group begins to realize that most people standing in line paid for VIP tickets. Even though Tana had always said that this was a free event, the VIP was just meant to be an extra option. 
Not that that mattered because by the time people made it to the registration desk, many people were just handed VIP badges without even verifying their ticket confirmation or anything. Again, presumably because the staff was so overwhelmed and just trying to move people through as quickly as possible. For the people who did manage to get their VIP badges, they were handed a sheet of PVC disguised as a bag with their highly coveted exclusive items worth quadruple the $65 they paid to get in, remember? Inside the bag were some PETA stickers, an ad for Owevo, a seemingly now defunct Vine knockoff, a rubber bracelet that said Gucci Queen, very reminiscent of the I Love Boobies bracelets everyone wore in my middle school, a TanaCon pop socket, and a Tana condom. Which I'm not gonna lie, as a lover of portmanteaus, I'm a fan. Kind of a bummer if you're allergic to latex though. Well, for the 1,000 or so dehydrated fans who did manage to get into the event, they had quite the show inside. They could walk through the crowded yet undecorated hallways while security yelled at them to keep moving. They could watch the actual hotel guests trying to squeeze past the horde of teenage girls crowding the lobby, or go into the various meet and greet rooms. Because remember, everyone with VIP tickets got one guaranteed private meet and greet and fast passes to all of the meet and greets. How does a fast pass work when everyone in the building has one? Well, it turns out that unbeknownst to most people, you actually had to pre-register for meet and greets, and there were reportedly only around 150 available slots to actually meet creators. So it seems like the only option really was to go to the main ballroom where the real magic was happening. The first event to get the crowd going was the official TanaCon wedding where Emma Chamberlain was the flower girl. And yes, I did look it up. They are in fact divorced now. And Gabby Hanna began frantically performing an acapella cover of Tana's song Hefner. Although the music festival portion of the event was originally scheduled for day two of TanaCon, it seemed like the organizers were panicked to fill time and were just sending any influencer they could grab onto that stage to save the show. Part of the issue was that a lot of creators booked for TanaCon had accidentally been scheduled for TanaCon appearances at the same time as their VidCon appearances. And unlike TanaCon, these creators actually had contracts with VidCon that required them to appear at their scheduled events. Around 1.30, security came into the main stage and hallways and began frantically telling everyone that they needed to leave the building. Some people at that moment thought there might be a shooter in the building, which given the crowds and the lack of security was a very valid fear. Others thought, man, my heat exhaustion must be worse than I thought because I'm pretty sure I just saw a ghost running around on a Segway. Yes, throughout the chaos, CEO of Good Times, Michael, was going down with his ship in the most efficient mode of transportation possible. I'm sure the Segway also helped herd the masses of angry children, kind of like a sheepdog. But quickly, people realized that the event wasn't actually getting shut down. They were just forcing the people who were already in to leave so that other people standing outside could come in. Although the original idea was that people would be coming and going freely, once people got into TanaCon, they were told that if they left at any point, they would be sent to the very back of that six hour line. So yeah, people were not going to leave unless it was by force. And once again, so many of the people here are teenagers who are now being kicked out onto the streets of Anaheim with no plans for where they'll go next. They were effectively just shoving the safety hazard they already had inside back into this Marriott parking lot. Finally, at around 4.30, Tana's manager Jordan grabs Tana and says, listen, we're cooked. This is critical, okay? We are in absolute Tana and Bella go out to hand water bottles out to some of the fans who were still in line at this point, and Michael's assistant tells the very angry mob that the event has been canceled for the day. At that point, the police and fire marshal arrive and begin angrily escorting both people inside and outside of the hotel off the premises. So what happened? Why did they have to cancel for the day? Everything was going so smoothly. 
Well, according to Tana and Michael, even though they had only planned for 5,000 people, 20,000 people had unexpectedly stormed the Marriott Hotel. It was the original insurrection, apparently. To put that number into perspective, less than 30,000 people reportedly attended VidCon in 2018, which was the giant convention center a block away. Presumably, if these were all people who had left VidCon to see TanaCon, the Anaheim Convention Center would have been basically deserted. You'd also see a crowd the size of a sold-out basketball arena in this Marriott parking lot. There was not 20,000 people outside. It's definitely possible that people without tickets showed up, again, Tana told people they could do that, and VidCon was right there. But if you ask literally anyone who was there besides Michael and Tana, no one else thought that 20,000 people showed up. But hey, it's a lot easier to defend why your event went poorly if a giant mob unexpectedly shows up. And any event with 20,000 people begging to get in must be way cooler and better than that stinky VidCon ever was. So Tana gets on Instagram Live and tells everyone, listen, the event was going great, but you know, 20,000 people were there. Did I mention there were 20,000 people? Because there were 20,000 people. And for some reason, Sophia Grace of Sophia Grace and Rosie fame is in the chat, but also James Charles has some things to say. Good Times initially said that they were working on getting a second venue that would accommodate another 5,000 people. And Tana was seen partying it up at her birthday party. So surely day two would happen, right? Well, when fans once again walked up to the Marriott, they saw a segwayless Michael and his assistant standing at the front. Presumably Michael realized given the seriousness of the situation, flexing his cool transportation at this moment would have been inappropriate. In an impromptu press conference only rivaled by the Four Seasons Landscaping Conference, Michael announces that day two of TanaCon will not be happening. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Oh, right, refunds. Well, according to Good Times, if you wanted a refund, you would need to submit a claim on their website by January of 2019, or you could feel free to use your TanaCon ticket to go to one of their future events. Yeah, people were not happy with that. But it gets worse. People quickly found the event space TanaCon had booked at the Marriott and discovered that the biggest room could only accommodate 1,000 people according to the hotel website. And I'm sure once you had a giant stage and barricade at the front of the room, that number would be even lower. Even including the lobby, the hallways, and the smaller meet and greet rooms, this space could never fit the 5,000 people who had registered for the event. The local police also released a statement confirming that the event had been shut down by hotel staff and that they had escorted between 4 and 5,000 people out of the event, which again lines up with the other evidence that there were roughly 5,000 paying attendees. The police also confirmed that there was a young girl who was taken to the hospital with minor injuries after being knocked down by the crowd. Multiple attendees posted their own severe sunburns, footage of a young girl being taken out on a stretcher in tears, and just the dire conditions inside and outside the event. People were pissed, and quite honestly, everyone was very lucky that no one was more seriously hurt. They needed answers preferably in the form of three different hour and a half long documentaries. The first documentary to come out was a three-part series investigating TanaCon by everyone's favorite cat-loving boy, Shane Dawson. As I mentioned earlier, Shane was a big draw for TanaCon. Although this wasn't his event, there certainly were a lot of upset Shane Dawson fans who wanted answers, and beyond probably wanting to help his friend Tana save her career, I'm sure his name being so closely tied to the event also pushed him to come out with this documentary in the way that he did. I know this might sound shocking, but Shane thought that TanaCon might be a conspiracy. Shane said, what if this event was set up to fail to get the event company Good Times some free promo. I mean, personally, if I hear of an event company that gives thousands of children third degree sunburns, I am first in line to work with them myself. I see the logic. Shane's only real evidence for this theory is the fact that he's never heard of Good Times before. Michael, the guy who was the CEO, CEO of whatever Good Times is, I don't even know if that's a real thing. I don't. Is it a company? I guess he's still working on his object permanence. Shane is also incredibly suspicious of Michael because Michael says that he is working on his own TanaCon documentary. And everyone knows 
that that is Shane's thing. This entire interview with Michael, Shane takes the time to zoom in on every fidget or awkward pause Michael takes with just the most cliche horror music in the background. It's very subtle, very balanced. Thankfully, his husband Ryland says, well, Shane, they probably just oversold the event and are trying to make a documentary as a lame cash grab because now they're out hundreds of thousands of dollars. Or it's a conspiracy run by lizard people, both still equal possibilities in Shane's mind at that point. But Shane insists that he is going to hold Tana accountable and he's not gonna go easy on her just because he's an empath who loves a good conspiracy. I'm like, I, 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 I know, I know, I know. I know. I'm so sorry. Shane does ask some very valid questions to Tana. For example, why did Tana go on vacation with Bella Thorne the week before TanaCon? He doesn't really ask any follow-up questions there, but still a valid question. Also, Tana, weren't you at a party the night before TanaCon was canceled? No, see, Shane, Tana was working, trying to figure out how to resolve the situation. She just happened to be doing that at her own birthday party in a club with alcohol. I mean, it's a new world. You can work from anywhere these days. Tana also has proof that she was much more involved than Michael claims. She has footage from two, count them, two different meetings. In one scene, Tana is walking around with Michael at the hotel, asking very basic questions as he describes the event space. Michael, is the lighting cool? Like when you really change? I'm sitting here asking him every question about him. Do they want a talent lounge or do they want Beats me? We should figure that out. Yeah, yeah. I've asked Jin Lo. Whoa, whoa! That was like a conspiracy moment. And in the other scene, Tana is with Michael and his assistant, who say they want the festival to feel like a mosh pit. Regardless, like... Like a mosh pit. But a safe one. Yeah. <laughs> but a safe one! But a safe one, Tana said, but a safe one. And to be honest, Michael, Shane, and Tana all sort of set up this false dichotomy where it's either Tana didn't care at all and didn't show up to anything, or she was totally invested and Michael was the one who screwed her over. Where it's very apparent that the truth is somewhere in the middle, just because Tana didn't actively want the event to fail or be a hazard, doesn't mean she couldn't have put more effort into planning and running the event. And the same absolutely goes for Michael, much more so because he was the one actually in charge of running these things. To Shane's credit though, he does make the very valid point that as much as Tana insisted that her intentions were good, they weren't. This entire event was made to spite VidCon. It was made the same weekend, within walking distance, all planned within less than two months. If Tana really cared about her fans' safety and enjoyment, she would have taken longer to plan it. In going about the event the way that she did, she put her own petty grievances above her own fans' safety. And Tana does acknowledge that. She acknowledges that it was selfish to plan the event as soon as she did. In the end, Shane's docuseries concludes that both Michael and Tana tried their best, but ultimately they were young, inexperienced, and incapable of making this event succeed. Shane also said that he wanted to do a free meet and greet experience for all the people who registered to meet him. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that never <laughs> happened. So now we move on to Tana's documentary. Well, to be honest, I don't know if this is a documentary, if it's a tell-all, if it's an apology video. If it's an apology video, it definitely has some insane editing. Everything kept growing and growing and growing and people started tweeting TanaCon, TanaCon. There really isn't any new information in this video per se, although Tana does say at the beginning of this video that this whole thing was originally going to be a complete expose of all of the horrible things she had learned, presumably about Michael, separate from TanaCon. She said she had originally decided to talk about claims of sexual assault, embezzlement, fraud, but her and Shane decided that it was not the right time to talk about all those things. But I mean, she kind of does talk about it because she put that at the front of the video. I don't know. So instead, her video is mostly recapping the Shane docuseries from her perspective. And what I find really interesting about this video is that throughout, Tana emphasizes how many people told her Michael was shady before she even started working with him. People were coming out of the fucking woodworks to tell me how much they didn't like him and how I shouldn't work with him. James Charles and Bella Thorne begged her not to work with him. Everyone told her that he was a scammer, a horrible person, 
but Tana said that that only made her want to work with him more. This was six years ago, so hopefully if that's all true, she's unpacked that because, oh my god, being told a guy is shady and working with him anyways is not the defense that 20-year-old Tana thinks that it is. But in the end, Tana acknowledges that even though she was led astray by an evil, manipulative man, it is still ultimately her fault. And she is working to try and plan some free meet and greets for people who did buy tickets. She also later said in a tweet that the ad revenue from this video would go to comping people's flights and travel costs they incurred trying to go to TanaCon. Which again, correct me if I'm wrong, really, I don't think that happened. I don't think these promises of free meet and greets and comped travel plans from Shane and Tana were ever super realistic to begin with. Given how TanaCon itself went, they would need so much money for security, presumably multiple different venues, travel to get to those venues. Do Shane and Tana probably have that kind of money? Yes. But realistically, y'all, I don't think that was ever going to happen. So it's wild how often this gets thrown out as like a reasonable way to make good on TanaCon. It's just like digging them a deeper hole. Let's just work on getting people's tickets refunded, okay? But we still have one more documentary from Michael Wiest. Michael's documentary was the last to premiere, but somehow I think it is the lowest effort of the three. His documentary is essentially just like raw footage of him planning the event, including clips we actually had seen in Shane's docuseries earlier. The one that definitely makes Tana look the worst is this clip, which Shane also did show. Like people love to be oppressed outside. Yeah. They're just like, I laid it in the rain. Like, they love that shit. Oh, I love that shit. And I'm sure when Tana said that, she didn't literally mean she wanted people out there for six hours. But yeah, it was not a great look. The wildest revelation, though, was that at Tana and Michael's first in-person meeting, less than a month before the event, Michael shows Tana how many tickets they have sold. And it does show that there are around 5,000 paid VIP tickets available and only 200 free tickets. Which, yeah, makes sense. I think even if Tana had forgotten that that happened or like didn't look very closely at it, if you stopped and thought for a second, it would be very apparent that most of the tickets were not free. They couldn't be. They needed to sell half those VIP tickets just to break even on the cost of booking the hotel. Michael even told Tana that they were going to turn hundreds of thousands of dollars in profit, which if this event was mostly free, how would that be possible? This meeting was after Tana first tweeted about the free tickets, sure, but she still continued to promote this as a mostly free event and said in Shane's docuseries that she thought it was 4,000 free tickets and 1,000 paid. At best, she had to be willfully ignorant, right? There are certainly moments in this documentary that do not put Tana in the best light. All that being said though, this documentary doesn't exactly exonerate Michael either. In the meetings we see with Tana, they're talking, throwing out a bunch of ideas, a Facetune photo booth, a mugshot station, parties for all the featured creators. But these all feel like ideas you have when you're first planning an event. It's just like, wouldn't it be cool if we put Bella Thorne in a dunk tank? I mean, yeah, it would be, but the event is in four weeks. This clearly is not logistically possible by any standard. And at the end of the day, I would not expect a 19-year-old Tana who does not plan events to know what is realistically achievable in that time span. It is up to Michael and his event coordinator and the rest of his team to say, hey, how much does it cost to order these things? What's the time frame to get these things? Is this physically possible in the budget, space, and time frame we've set? With the answer being a resounding no. I can kind of understand Tana being delusional about the event that she's planned. If she has what she thinks is a team of professionals working with her, just saying yes to every crazy idea she has. But their inability to tell Tana no is obviously far from Good Time's biggest failing here. In his own documentary, Michael says that the hotel has capped capacity for the space at around 3,000, which already seems generous given the biggest ballroom can only hold 1,000 people. But he has set the event's total attendance at 5,000, which Tana is very enthusiastic about, by the way. I told him because like the hotel told him 1,200. But obviously, like, in like the main ballroom. Oh, uh, like, 3,000 is like. 
That's our thing. That's like doubles. Like, like blue. I have it set at fifty two hundred right now. I mean, I mean, we could drop it to three thousand if we wanted to instead of fifty two hundred. I could. <laughs> what are we gonna? <laughs> Again, there is no thought as to how much capacity is produced by the stage, the booths they're planning, the individual lines they would need for meet and greets. This is another instance where, yes, if Tana had stopped for a minute, she could have noticed that there was a problem with this. But an event team absolutely should have saw the dangerous situation they were setting themselves up for. Especially when the Good Times team only ended up with a very limited security team, where at most, there were only 25 security guards for a crowd of 5,000 to 20,000 people. Maybe this was all discussed in more specificity at some other point, but I have to imagine if they had more exonerating footage, they would have shown it, and Michael did say that they filmed everything. Although I don't think this event was designed to intentionally fail or harm anyone, it just didn't seem like there was any real thought put towards actual logistics, let alone the physical safety of the attendees or crowd control, which is ironic given that the reason Tana was banned from VidCon was because her mere presence created safety hazards for fans who wanted to meet her. And Michael can't even address these concerns in an interview because he declined to comment in his own documentary. So after just so, so many documentaries, where did that actually leave things? Well, as I mentioned earlier, initially to get a refund for TanaCon, you needed to file a claim with the ticketing company Veeps before January 1st of that year. This is because according to Michael, Veeps were the one who held onto the funds and Good Times could not refund directly. And this is just a side note, but Veeps was founded by Joel Madden, the good Charlotte guy. And this was also supposed to be their first time as a ticket processing company for a major event. So truly no one in this scenario was prepared for things to go sideways. But eventually Veep sent a follow-up email saying refunds would be available if you reached out with the email you used to purchase your ticket. The refunds still were not automatic, but you could directly apply for that refund. Many attendees ended up filing claims with their bank or credit cards because Veep's process took too long or was unresponsive, but it seems that most people did eventually get their money back one way or another, at least for the cost of their ticket. As for their travel expenses and skin damage, yeah, it seems people were on their own for that. Tana was, of course, able to move on with her career, and nowadays TanaCon is just a fever dream that only seems to be brought up when Tana has another inevitable scandal or, you know, January 6th happens. Tana did, however, dress up as Michael for Halloween in October of 2018. Some may say, hey, that might be too soon. Others might say, oh my god, Tana as Michael Weiss is right behind you. As for Michael, his journey has been... I was about to say more chaotic, but I don't think anyone has a more chaotic internet presence than Tana's. Unlike Tana, Michael at the end of the day did not have millions of adoring fans to fall back on after the scandal. There are a lot of things that Tana Moja will be remembered for, but for better or worse, Michael Wiest will always be remembered as the TanaCon Segway guy, and ultimately the person who took the majority of the blame in this situation. And that is on top of him reportedly declaring bankruptcy shortly after all this happened. I do think that somewhat explains the path he's been on since TanaCon happened. Let me explain. In 2020, Twitter users discovered that TanaCon appears to be trademarked under Michael Weiss's name. Also, around that same time, a website went live selling TanaCon merch with labels linked to Michael's other company, Juice Crate. There was also an Instagram page, which did not have any posts, but did have an Eventbrite tab. So people immediately began speculating, is TanaCon 2.0 happening without Tana? I mean, no, who would want to go to a TanaCon without Tana Mojo? But pretty quickly after this got out, Tana petitioned to cancel the trademark, which did ultimately end up happening. Michael Weist no longer has the TanaCon trademark. I should also say trademark law is not anywhere near my area of expertise and people dedicate their entire legal careers to this stuff and I am truly just a girl. But according to Michael, he initially filed for the trademark the day of TanaCon back in 2018. But because of the length of the trademark process, it did not go through until 2020. 
and according to Michael, he had never had any intention of running a second TanaCon. I do still wonder why he would continue with the trademark process up until 2020 when Michael and Tana were not on speaking terms at that point. If Michael had successfully maintained the trademark, Tana herself likely would not be able to sell TanaCon merch, have a second TanaCon run by a different organizer, without reaching some sort of agreement with Michael first, nor would anyone else for that matter. So there were certainly benefits to having the trademark, even if you yourself were not planning a second event. The same goes for the TanaCon Instagram handle, the domain name. If people wanted to use that in the future, they would need to go through the owners of those handles. But again, that's just speculation on my part. Only my goal knows for sure. And you know what they say, there is no better place to get to the truth of the situation then on Dr. Phil, imagine the TanaCon story being broken wide open while you're in a Mr. Tire lobby waiting for your oil to get changed. Yes, in May of 2021, a Dr. Phil episode entirely centered on Michael and TanaCon premiered. I'm sure you'll be shocked to learn that Dr. Phil was not the best platform to get to the bottom of this, especially when there's just like a haunting wall of Zoom screens behind them this entire conversation. Amanda from Swell Entertainment certainly did her best to ask meaningful questions. I'll actually link the full interview she did with Michael on her channel. I found it a lot more interesting to watch, honestly. Although it is worth noting that in this Dr. Phil episode, Michael's former employees do make some concerning allegations. Michael's former assistant, who you could see in all the TanaCon footage, said that before a convention, Michael told her she needed to earn a bed for the night and was only able to get a hotel because Tana and her team arranged it for her. Others described experiencing verbal abuse and a toxic work environment, all of which Michael denied. And generally, this interview just confirmed once again that this entire event was run by emotionally stunted people in their early 20s who had more money and more power than they knew what to do with, which is perhaps not the most shocking revelation at this point. I do also have to say that at some point, I saw that Michael wrote a book called Verified Vanity. According to the copy, Verified Vanity is a poignant, powerful, and insightful look into the world of influencers, content creators, and Hollywood's up-and-coming prodigies from the perspective of Michael Wiest, one of LA's youngest talent managers. And at the end of the copy, it says that this book is a collection of essays about the many sides of young Hollywood fame and fortune, from fangirl obsession, collab house life, black market verification, to his vision for social media, and the failed TanaCon. So naturally, being the dedicated professional that I am, I bought it used on Amazon for $1.24 so I could tell you all the full story. <laughs> and truly, nothing prepared me for what was in this book when it came. I honestly don't know why more people aren't talking about this because this like changed my perspective on everything. Oof, okay, why am I nervous? Okay, so in this book, this book I have here, Michael says, Nothing. This book is blank. It's blank. There's nothing here. Genuinely, I think this might be the best response to TanaCon there ever could be. Like, I fully just got conned. And yeah, maybe this was just a misprint. But if I wanted another copy, I would need to pay Michael directly $35. And you know what? Something about already having one entirely blank book does not instill confidence. I do not think that this book exists. There are zero reviews anywhere. Even the ebook on Google is entirely blank. The audacity of it all, I, I kind of have to appreciate. If Caroline Calloway had just published an entirely blank book after all this time, I think I would fully be on her side. What do you even say to this? It's nothing. This book is nothing. So while Michael is busy chatting it up with Chris Hansen from To Catch a Predator, I'm sitting here at $1.24 poorer than when I was before. And I think that says it all. For what it's worth, while TanaCon's failures certainly were not the fault of VidCon, VidCon has tried to make up for how they mismanaged Tana's presence at their own convention. Back in 2016 and 2017, VidCon had grown beyond its small niche that the online creating space used to be, and it struggled to figure out how to accommodate this growing audience and found that it no longer had just one identity. Since this time, Hank Green said, in 2017, I 100% screwed up. 
Hannah was part of our content, and not making her a featured creator was a bad call. If we were going to have her do content, she should have been a featured creator. We were being conservative because of some things Tana had done and said in the past, but we should either have had her there or not, not that shitty in-between thing. This isn't the first time we screwed up, and it won't be the last. This is a hard business, and I'm not saying, oh, TanaCon is all my fault, but I think it's important to recognize when we make mistakes, regardless of the mistakes other people make. And VidCon did eventually make Tana a featured creator in 2019. Which is not to say that VidCon as it exists now is a perfect convention that's solved all its problems or it's figured out what branch of the internet it's really catering to. I still hear plenty of complaints about VidCon both from creators and fans alike. And at this point, it's grown so big that some of these problems just feel unsolvable. And that's where I feel like it genuinely is a disappointment that TanaCon wasn't a success. I think if Tana had managed to put on a smaller, safe, event where fans could interact with a more niche group of content creators as well as other fans, there is a market for that kind of thing. There is value in seeing a community you care about online suddenly in person and in one space. Speaking from experience, kids who were raised by the internet often struggle to find that community in real life, and conventions are absolutely an outlet to meet people who share similar interests, buy art from a local artist that references something you thought only you cared about, and just revel in your own nerdy interest for a few hours. YouTuber tours can certainly fill that niche, but as we know, not every YouTuber is suited to a staged, structured, hour and a half performance. Performance. Genuinely, if Drew, Danny, and Curtis put on a commentary con, I would be first in line. But as people learn the hard way from TanaCon, conventions take a lot of time and a lot of money to truly be successful. And ultimately, again, we were just so lucky that no one was more seriously hurt from this. I mean, people don't even plan weddings in two months. It took a lot of ego from Tana and Michael and everyone else involved to think a major event like this could be made in that time frame. And ultimately, if the success of your event hinges on the use of segues, it's time to step away. Or wheel away, I guess. And folks, that is all I have for today. Oh my gosh, okay. I hope everything in the new setup worked okay. Um, if it doesn't, I will work on it. It's so weird filming again. I know it hasn't been that long since I uploaded for y'all, but I pre-filmed my Bachelor in Paradise video like back in August. So I haven't like gotten to sit down and talk to y'all in what feels like a really long time. And I'm just very excited to be here, make more content for y'all. I have a lot of exciting ideas for future videos in this new space. So I hope y'all are excited too. As usual, if you want to see more from me, you can watch me on Twitch. I stream me struggling to play video games a couple times a week and upload the VODs of that to my second channel. I also upload monthly bonus videos on my Patreon, if any of y'all want to check that out. Last month, I talked about the secret lives of Mormon wives because I was absolutely obsessed with that show. Can't wait for season two. And if you're not interested in any of that, that's cool. Totally get it. However, if you liked this video, you could like, comment, subscribe, and I will see y'all in the next one. Bye.